For 3,000 miles and more, in a broad belt across the west of Africa, dwarfing the struggles of its peoples, stretches the tropical rainforest, a twilight land where the sun penetrates only in shafts of sudden silver against the dim recesses of a world of trees. This is a story about those trees, about pioneering, about natural resources hitherto thought inaccessible, about a great enterprise, and what that enterprise means to a people fast emerging into the 20th century of an industrial west. of thousands of square miles of it. Walnut and mahogany, Agbar and Iroko, Sapoli wood, White Afara, Obeki and a dozen more. Giant trees towering high above the surrounding bush. For countless centuries, the African had used the trees of the forest. Here and there on the river's bank, they were his canoe or the timbers of a village hut. The forest was his home, and he used it for his simple needs. A comb, a bowl, a hut, a canoe. Other than that, in the main, nothing. The trees grew and grew old, rotted and fell. The tropical creepers covered them, the worms and the termites bored their way into them. And in the humid forest air, slowly they crumbled away, back into the soil from which they had sprung. That was the rainforest, primordial, ever-growing, ever-wasting. Oh yes, people had often thought of cutting timber on a big scale, but the undertaking was too immense the risks too great. The trees worth cutting didn't grow conveniently in great masses like a pine forest. They grew far apart, often in inaccessible places. No one even knew if there were enough good trees to make it pay. Well, of course, you could always go and count them, someone said. Count the trees? It was just a dream. <laughs> Sapoli, 70 miles from the sea, the highest point upriver an ocean-going ship can reach. Sapoli is a boom town. A few years ago, it was a little trading post. Now it's bursting its seams with people come to look for gold in the streets. Charms and fetishes, monkey skulls and dried snakes heads, bicycles and wireless sets jostle and jumble. Prosperity has come to Sapphire, a prosperity never known before. For in Sapphire, miles from anywhere in the heart of the bush, had been built the United Africa Company's two great plants, a modern plywood factory using every latest technique the West could offer, and at its side, one of the most up-to-date sawmills in the world.
here was the source of the new prosperity. At last, the dark, secret rainforests were giving up their riches. Here at the mill, there was work, not for one or two, but for a thousand or more, and a thousand new things to learn. About insecticides that kill the voracious tropical woodworms and beetles. About tools that work by power instead of sweat. About trucks with arms in their bellies that would pick up sawn timber by the ton. And the river's bank at Sapele was only one end of the story. In the Gold Coast, a thousand miles away from here, was an operation on the same scale. The twin half of a venture that needed millions of pounds to start and is unique in the whole history of forestry. They said you couldn't harvest the rainforest on an industrial scale. The difficulties were too great. Now, crane load by crane load, the timber rattles down into the holes. Log after log. So many tons, so much a ton. The mahogany comes up out of the water and the sapley wood goes down into the hold. That it had needed more than a team of sweating, laboring men to get them there, more than a quayside in the heart of the bush. It had needed the building of a great and complex organization. And it started with a man who said, you could always go and count the trees. That's just what they did, count the trees. It meant cutting a way through the bush for weeks and months and years, away from all touch with civilization. It meant hacking a way through thousands of miles of unknown forest, uphill and downhill, and finding out what was there. Mile after mile, a trail was forced. They called it enumeration. Three thousand miles of tropical rainforest. Reports indicated areas available for operations in the Gold Coast and Nigeria. In the most favorable of these areas, options were taken out and sample enumeration started. In a straight line across the jungle, backwards and forwards, a path was cut. And all the way, Every tree above a certain minimum size was measured and recorded. And that was only the sample. There was another stage to come. Everywhere logging was to begin, the whole area was divided up into squares of one square mile. Each square was then divided by walkable traces into eight sections. And that done, a team of men walked in line abreast, 20 yards apart, down the length of each and every section. In line abreast, 20 yards apart, over every section of every mile of every concession, everywhere where felling was to start. Each time a man saw a big enough tree of the right type, the enumerator was called up. If it was fully mature, for only mature trees were to be cut, the species and its exact position were noted down. The trees were measured and numbered and put on the map. Yard by yard, the line went on, leaving behind a forest of marked trees. In the past, in the ancient world and in the forests of America, men had descended like locusts, leaving not a tree standing. Then, where once a canopy of leaves had sheltered the ground, the rains poured onto the naked earth, flooding the rivers and leaving devastation behind. 
Sometimes even the climate changed. Men felled the trees and their children inherited a desert. But this was not to be a wholesale slaughter. Here, trees were to be cut only on a hundred years cycle, allowing for the continuous regeneration of the forest. When the axemen were gone, it would be their great-great-grandsons who cut the forest next. Forests of the earth are man's inheritance, not for one generation alone, but for all generations. On this basis of respect for nature, a new industry was founded. Forestry operations started on a vast scale with all the knowledge and resources of the West behind them. Not only to Sapphire had a new prosperity come. Carried on the roar and clatter of steel tracks, it reached deep into the forest, drawing in men often from villages hundreds of miles distant. Three thousand miles and a year away, a craftsman would painstakingly polish the decorative grain of a table or a chair, the panelling of a room, the showcase of a shop in London or Leeds. But for the African in the forest, it meant something very different. It meant that almost overnight, the 20th century had come into his life. ago, a man had heaved and sweated and strained at a rope. Now he was master of a machine. One hundred years or more it took to grow, that tree. A hundred years of spring and summer, sunshine and rain. Now a day will bring it crashing to the ground.
through seed and sapling to maturity. So lived and died a tree, that a new seed might grow tall in its place. Now, carefully sighted all through the felling areas appeared the collection yards. For a tree in the forest is worth nothing. First, you have to get it out. Here at the collection yard, the whole complexity of the forestry operation begins to emerge. Now the log leaves the forest for a different world. A world of movement and organization. A world of machinery. The collection point is the beginning of the road. The entire system of roads that had to be built to transport the logs. For transport is the key to the whole forestry operation. There might be a hundred miles of jungle between you and the river's bank. And often the river is the only way out. So the logs, weighing maybe ten tons apiece, are hoisted onto lorries. Fleets of lorries with mechanics and repair shops and stores and fuel and spare parts to keep them going. Everything you need, you bring in yourself. Just as you build the roads yourself and maintain them and rebuild them when the torrential tropical rains wash them away. Half a mile of timber that once would have rotted in the forest, now resting gently on the waters of the Ethiop River. But every log that splashes down into the water is the reward of risks accepted and difficulties overcome. Log by log and section by section, the timber is made up into rafts. Huge rafts to be towed a hundred miles and more down river to Sapphire, down to the mills. Log by log, using the creepers of the forest, it's lashed together. Twenty logs in a section. That's maybe two hundred tons of precious hardwoods to be pulled into place. It all looks so simple, so careless. But beneath the quiet surface, the currents are swift and treacherous. And a man who stumbled could be crushed relentlessly between tons of rolling timber. Two hundred tons to a section, five sections to a raft. A thousand tons of hardwoods on the end of a pole that used to be the center of a palm frond. 
thousand tons to push and shove away from the bank and out into midstream. Once you're away from the bank, the watchman takes up residence. There, beneath his roof of bamboo thatch, he'll live until the raft arrives. He's not exactly living in the lap of luxury, but somehow watchmen always seem to manage. It used to take a month or more for the raft to drift on the current down to Sapony. Now, with diesel tugs, it takes less than a week. 4,000 miles away in London, other men are studying the pulse of world markets, calculating prices and freight charges, while yet the timber is hardly wet with the water of the Ethiop. But here, the palm oil chop bubbles on the watchman's fire, and the tug pulls the raft steadily on down between the green river banks, down to the mill. Millions of feet of hardwood. But it's more than just timber floating down to Sapphire. It's a visible sign of the true interdependence of Africa and the West. Reward for the West, without whose knowledge and resources those logs would have rotted back into the ground. Reward for the African, for it means wealth for the tribe on whose land it stood. Yesterday, it was a risk no one would take. Today, it's a great industry providing revenue for tribe and government and employment for thousands. You built roads where there were no roads, trained men straight from their villages in a hundred new skills, brought machines where machines had never been. You came into the forest, and where you came, you created wealth, where before it had wasted back into the earth. Yesterday, they were counting the trees, a small band of men hacking their way up hill and down, mile after mile through the dense bush. Today, from that twilight forest, timber for the world is on its way out 